Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be back at .NET Conf here in 2022 and I'm really excited to talk to you about embedded IoT uh, development and prototyping with Meadow and .NET. So my name is Adrian Stevens and if you don't know me, I've actually been in the .NET C Sharp space for a long time. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the mobile space with Xamarin and, uh, and now Maui. Uh, I've done a lot of, of .NET development in cloud and of course in IoT. And I spent a lot of that uh, as a developer and a lot of it as an educator. And I love being able to share my passions and hopefully teach you something, uh, something interesting so you can maybe get a little bit further into the IoT ecosystem. And this is a really interesting and fast growing marketplace. And now's a really good time to get into building hardware. We're gonna cover a lot today. We're gonna go right from the hello world of, dot, uh, of IoT, uh, flashing a light. I'll show you how to flash light on Meadow. Then we'll look at what it looks like to bring in additional hardware and build some more complex builds to add in some custom hardware and then control that uh, in C-sharp and .NET. And we'll do that using drivers in the Meadow Foundation uh, library. From there, we're gonna see how we can do rapid prototyping on a new board called Project Lab. That's gonna simplify some of that hardware design to get you into writing the software and controlling your IoT solutions. We'll see what that looks like, talk to cloud systems, and then I've got a bonus topic, which is going a little bit further uh, into your uh, hardware development and being one step closer to commercialization and how that's actually being accelerated in this case by an open source community contribution. Uh, stick around for that, lots of fun. So for this talk, there's one thing I really wanna get across, and that is that we're doing full .NET on a microcontroller. And this is really unique in the industry. This is, a, this is a pretty amazing moment here. Now we've had lots of ways of doing IoT in the past, and we've even had some options for doing .NET IoT. You know, the first thing that people often think about is, hey, well, I can run .NET on a Raspberry Pi on that single board computer. And you absolutely can. The Raspberry Pi is a phenomenal piece of hardware but it really is a single board computer. It has more in common with a desktop or laptop than it does with a microcontroller. It has a full power uh, processor, which then actually uses a lot of battery, a lot of power electricity. Of course, it has lots of memory. It has a multitasking environment. And so it has all the benefits of these full-blown multitasking environments, but of course, all those limitations as well. And one of the big limitations is, again, it drains more power, so it's hard to run on things like solar or battery. Um, and the inherent instability of a multitasking environment. Of course, we know Linux is very stable, but still, um, when you're running multiple applications, there is those, those risks of security and stability. And then that path to commercialization is a little bit harder as well. Now, on the flip side, we have a couple of options for doing .NET on microcontrollers. There's things like the micro framework and the nano framework, and these are really interesting, really fantastic ways of doing .NET. But the names really do indicate their limitations. They're subsets of .NET. And so, yes, if you're writing C Sharp and you are working in a .NET environment, so you get all the benefits of .NET, but you don't get the full API surface. That's gonna mean that you're gonna miss out on some of the modernizations of the language. Uh, you're gonna miss out on a lot of the new APIs. And it means you're not gonna be able to code share across your IoT uh, project with your other projects like your desktop, your mobile, or your web projects. And so Meadow really is unique in the industry. And this is that sweet spot of full .NET on real microcontrollers. And I'm actually really excited because Meadow has just released Release Candidate 1, which means that version 1.0 is right around the corner. Teams are working really hard, building up features, increasing stability, increasing performance. And so Meadow is really almost ready to go full production, full commercialization. So now is a beautiful time to get into IoT with Meadow and C Sharp. Uh, of course, Meadow brought to you by Wilderness Labs. Uh, check out the website, www.wildernesslabs.co. There is so much great content here. Getting started guides, uh, amazing write-ups for IoT electronics. Um, so this is a beautiful resource. Um, don't overlook this to get things started with Meadow. And of course you can go in there and you can purchase boards and hardware as well. So let's take a look at the hardware that we'll be using today. And this is the Meadow F7 uh, dev module. Now there's a lot going on on the screen, but it's actually a lot of really powerful information and it gives you uh, an indication. It gives you a sense of really what you can do with the Meadow board, a ton of IO input output. So you can do standard high and low input and output. You can read a button press. 
You can turn an LED off and on. Uh, you can do variable output in the form of pulse width modulation. You can do variable input in the form of analog reads. And it has all those industry standard communication protocols, things like SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface, uh, I2C, uh, Serial in the form of UART. And if all those terms uh, don't mean something to you today, that's okay. But what I want you to understand here is that Meadow has all the connectivity you need to connect to this massive ecosystem of hardware and peripherals that are on the market today. So let's switch over and look at some code and take a better look at the, at the Meadow board. So I'm gonna bring my camera on screen. So here's my Meadow, this is my, my Meadow F7 V2. Uh, really cool little board. So this one is just sitting on its own. Uh, some fun things to point out as well. So we have all these little little gold parts here. We call these uh, pins or something talks to um, ports. And that's where we connect peripherals. Uh, and what's fun about this board here as well is it is meant for, you know, potentially single or low volume use prototyping, but it can also be embedded into um, commercial applications. It has what we call castellations on the side of these pins. And that means we actually solder this right onto a PCB as well. So this can be used in, in commercial products as well. So I'm going to plug this in. And I mentioned, you know, single use, so not a multitasking environment, but Meadow apps run a single application, very common for, for true IoT. And so when I plug this in, it's going to run an application. I'm just going to pin down my wire here a little bit so it stays in the right orientation. <clears throat> and let's jump over and look at the code that's going to run on our application. So I'll make this a little bit smaller. So we are here in Visual Studio 2022. So this is full-blown Visual Studio. Uh, you can, of course, also use Visual Studio Code. Uh, I happen to be a, a long-term user of full-blown Visual Studio, and this is my comfort zone. Uh, but VS Code is also well-supported. And we just need to install an extension for Meadow in either of those environments, and we're up and running. Same for VS for Mac. And now we're just working in a normal Visual Studio solution with several projects. I'm going to focus on C-sharp today, but I, I added in these other projects just to show you, you can. It's .NET. So we can write our applications in F Sharp. We can even write applications in VB.net. Uh, a little fun fact, the very first VB.net app I ever wrote was actually the Blinky app for, Me <laughs> for Meadow here that ended up in the template. <clears throat> but let's look at the C Sharp version. Again, similarities across the other languages because they is the beauty of .net. So notice in this case, single file. Uh, we have our Meadow app class. It derives from this app class, and this gives us access to the Meadow hardware and Meadow lifecycle events. And this is actually new for this release as well. So if you're a longtime Meadow user, some new fun things in the lifecycle, check out the website for details. But a couple of standard things you're likely to do now um, is override an initialize method and a run method. And these are gonna run sequentially. So initialize runs first, and then, we'll, then the run method runs. And then what that lets us do is set up the hardware or the configuration of our Meadow application. Now, in this case, we're just flashing a little LED. You can see it changing colors here uh, on our board. And so what we need to do is talk to that onboard LED. So we have an object a courtesy of Meadow Foundation, and it's an RGB PWM LED. So it stands for red, green, blue. And that's actually an LED that actually is effectively three lights together, those three colors. PWM means that we can control the output, so we can basically control the brightness of each one independently, and it's an LED because that's what it is. Now, what we do here is we show you how, or we need to tell this object how to talk to the hardware, and we do that through the device object and by telling it how it's connected. Now, this is an internal part, so it connects to internal pins effectively, but we have an onboard LED for red, for green, and for blue. And what's powerful here now is this is all we need to talk to the hardware. We instantiate an onboard LED object. It knows how to talk to the physical aspect of the, of the part. And now everything else in here is just C sharp. So we finish our initialize method and then we go into run. Run calls a method called cycle colors. And cycle colors is gonna just loop through and just do a pulse of a whole bunch of different colors, blue and cyan and green, you can see here. And of course, this is now calling a helper method, show color pulse. And this here is now we're gonna, where we interact with our onboard LED object. We're gonna call a method called start pulse. We're gonna run it for the duration and then we're gonna stop it. And you can see here that we just pass in a color object and this method is called over and over again with different colors. But this is just C sharp. It's just standard, uh, standard use of, of public methods. And again, the only thing that is hardware specific in this case 
is this little bit of code here. And we can look at their languages and see similar aspects of that as well on F Sharp uh, and VB.net. So you're welcome to uh, you know, use a language that you prefer. Uh, most of the samples, of course, they are written in C Sharp, but there are some good F Sharp samples out there as well. And I do love that community, love functional programming. Okay, so blinking and LED, lots of fun, but you know, it's really more fun to build more complex things. So let's switch over hardware. And I'm gonna bring in, uh, something that's a bit more representative of what you might build. So here's a hardware build with a display and some other parts on it. So we can take a look. We've got a couple of buttons here. Uh, we've got our display that should fire up here in a moment. And then this little guy here is an analog temperature sensor. And you can see here, so this is a great one to look at for wiring. We've got the black and the red lines. They're actually gonna be the ground and power. For Meadow, that's a 3.3 volt power supply, uh, power rail. And then the middle lead actually is the analog output of our temperature sensor. So that runs there into, it'll be a little bit hard to see on the camera, but actually is running into, let's see if it'll focus, it's A0, it's the analog zero input pin. Put that back down. And it's running in read by room temperature. Um, it's analog, it might be a little bit high. I think it's quite 24 degrees in here, but it is warm. And let's look at some code here. Let me bring that up. So here's the code for our temperature monitor. And again, we see similar things here. So again, we've got a Meadow app class. We derive from our app class here again. Now this one knows it says V1. This is actually an older version of the Meadow hardware. So for those of you that have been around the Meadow system for a while, this is V1 hardware, it's still fully supported, of course. And I'm using that on our board here today. And again, we're just into good old fashioned C sharp. And I wanna show you, so just like we saw the LED be initialized, we do similar things here for the other sensors, other parts. So let's look at that analog temperature sensor, a really great example. So similar patterns, we have a class called analog temperature, and we need to tell it how it's connected. In this case, it's connected to an analog pin. Remember I said it was pin A0? Well, we need to tell it it's connected to pin A0. And the analog temperature sensors are actually a family of sensors. There's, there's several different variants that have different um, different analog output voltage levels based on the current temperature. And so the, the, our driver needs to understand how to translate that voltage into temperature. So we tell it this is an LM35. And notice that's all we have to do. So this is actually a lot going on because this sensor is reading temperature. It's sending out an, a variable voltage signal on that line, but we don't have to know how to convert that. We don't need to know the specifics of what each, you know, uh, what step of the voltage or what one volt means versus two volts. That's all done in the driver, in the analog temperature sensor object. We can just start using this by connecting it up and then using the analog temperature object. And that's exactly what we do here. Uh, so we, we sign it to analog temperature and then look at this, we're, we're subscribing to an event, to our temperature updated event. So we can now be notified every time the temperature changes and then react to that. And let's look at that, that method quickly. <clears throat> There's some other fun stuff here as well about display and graphics. I'm gonna show that to you in just another demo in just a moment. But analog temperature updates, this is kind of fun. So here, well, we wanna do two things, we want to get the new value, and then in this case, we're gonna update our display. So we have a, a change result object of type temperature. This is really interesting. So Meadow Foundation, the drivers we have here are unitized. What that means is the values that come back aren't just raw scalars, they have a unit associated. So we get a, 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 a temperature object, that's actually a struct, and we can now not just read the value, but read the value based on a subset of units. So we want it in Celsius, but if we decide we want it in Fahrenheit or Kelvin, we could do that as well. And so no guessing, uh, no crashing moon landers into the moon because we, we're not talking the same language. We can get the unit that we need uh, without guessing, without going back to the spec sheet or without wondering what the author driver has decided is the most appropriate unit today. Uh, everything's unitized, no guessing, pretty fantastic. So. Let's pause from the code and go back to the hardware. I'm gonna zoom this in. So there's a lot going on here and there's not a lot going on here. So we looked at the, the temperature sensor, which has three things to connect, power, ground, and a signal line that goes back to Meadow. And we see our buttons have some, some lines as well. Uh, and our display here, so notice there's actually four lines going to our display plus power and ground. And this is a SPI display, which is using, it's a three wire protocol, but we only need to use two of those wires because we're not, 
reading value back from the display. We're only sending information to the display. But SPI is a funny one because it'll sometimes be referred to as like a, like a four wire, but um, it usually has a couple of extra wires as well. So you have to use something called a, so you have a, like a reset pin to reset the hardware uh, and some other things so you can control multiple bits of hardware on the same bus. And so we got a couple of lines here and you might be looking at this saying, hey, I'm a software developer. This is a lot of hardware, a lot of wiring. This looks like it's easy to get wrong. And honestly, it's like everything else in technology. You're going to learn the foundations. A lot of it is, it's fundamental. And you absolutely, you can do this. You absolutely can do it. But I understand we're going to hardware. Well, that's a lot to learn. So you know what? We can make this a little bit easier for you. So instead of having to wire up all the parts by hand, which is a ton of fun. It's a lot like like those childhood blocks or, or things that you built in the past. I really love building hardware. But if you want to get right into building an IoT solution, we've got something called Project Lab. I'm going to bring this in. I'm going to start up an application. I'm going to use the other one. And we'll talk a little bit about this as well. So the Project Lab board is really meant for rapid prototyping. It's to save you the overhead of sourcing parts and wiring all those things up. But notice here it has a display, very much like the display we saw on the previous board. This is a 240 by 240 full color uh, TFT SPI display. Uh, high res, super sharp, can do lots of fun things with it. Got some buttons built in and it has some really powerful sensors as well. It has a light sensor, it has uh, an industry leading, I think it's probably the, almost the best one on the market right now uh, within price reason, the BMI 270. Uh, it does acceleration, gyroscopic, it does all kinds of great things for wearables, really powerful um, uh, uh, motion sensor. Uh, got an atmospheric sensor, this shows a BME 680, I think we've switched to a BME 680H, the more version of it, uh, temperature, uh, pressure, humidity, even, um, uh, air quality, and then a ton of extra expansion as well. Uh, but it has exposes a few more of our outputs. We have access to an analog pin, a couple of digital pins. There's also an RS-485, which is a standard, um, it's like a, a commercial enterprise uh, serial interface. So we can do that, it allows us to hook up to a lot of um, uh, commercial uh, sensors. And it has some standard form factors as well. It's really just different shapes of things we've already talked about. Uh, Grove uh, by Seed Studio. They've got some really cool uh, sensors that use a four wire cable. Really easy. No guessing about the pins right. Just plug it in and go. It has a, a quick or a Stemma QT connector. It really just exposes I2C. Uh, has power ground and then the two, a two wire bus for I2C. But a standard form factor. You'll see this uh, being adopted by a number of hardware vendors. Uh, Adafruit uses quite often on their parts as well. Same thing, plug it in and go, nice and quick. Don't have to worry about all the wires. Microbus, another standard form factor. This is a really cool one. Um, you can plug in more complex things. You see a lot of pins here. So you actually can use these pins. These are pin headers you can access directly, but it's actually meant for a Microbus part to plug right in. And actually, I might even show you that right now. And you see these Microbus connectors. And so here's like a Microbus part, for example. If I flip that over, you can see it has all the pins. And Microbus is interesting because it doesn't necessarily use all of the pins, but it has, they always populate on the boards and we just plug those in. And then we have access to, uh, I think there's hundreds if not thousands of, of Microbus parts that can be used today. And so here's our project lab, lots of things running on. And I'll just show you the app is running. You see temperature, pressure, humidity, uh, actually acceleration, that's this gravity right now. So obviously it's not moving, but it is being pulled down by the, well, by the earth. And as we move it around, we can see our gravity values change for X, Y, and Z. See that's focusing all right for you. And let's take a quick look at the code for this as well. Let me just bring up the project lab demo here. Shrink you down. And again, you're gonna see some common patterns. It's got an app class. Again, drive from um, Meadow app, drive some app. We're using a V2 board in this case again. Over initialize. In this case, we're actually using a helper class, uh, Project Lab Hardware, or actually on the B2 variant in this case. It's just uh... <clears> that. <throat> there we go. Uh, and that class is responsible for initializing the hardware. And I love this abstraction because we actually just launched a new NuGet package that will do all this for you. Because this is a standard configuration of hardware, we know which pins each part is plugged into. So this is a known pre-configured hardware 
we can use an actual NuGet package to do all of that installation for you and just give you access to the sensors. And you can see this here. In this case, we've got our light sensor. Make sure it's initialized, and then we can just start updating and reading changes in light values. Same thing, our atmospheric sensor. Start updating and read changes in the atmospheric values, whether it's pressure, temperature, humidity. Same thing for motion. And what's amazing about this, I know I'm moving quickly, but what's fun here is if you go through all of this, it's all done in 130 lines of code. And so again, you can start building really complex applications with that, with this uh, in just a few lines of code. Don't worry about the hardware, don't worry about the wiring. All right, so much to show you. A couple more things I wanna do before we run out of time today. I've got another product lab board, and this is, well, we can now use this to do more complex things. And so in this case, I'll let the app boot up, but I'm gonna to change to another sample. Uh, and, and this is where I think you know, some of my passions get really interesting. We start combining cloud with IoT. We can start doing really powerful things. And so in this case here, we have um, a sample app that actually talks to Azure Custom Vision. And this uses the cognitive services to do uh, image detection. Now, the app is a little bit fudged for simplicity and the purposes of the demo in that uh, this would normally work with a camera and we would take a picture uh, of our subject and then upload it to custom vision and then use cognitive services to tell us if our image matches our, our pre-trained uh, system. And I built this to detect our Boston Terrier puppy, uh, our little dog. Now, funny enough, I wasn't able to train the dog to sit still so I could take a picture of it live for the purposes of this presentation. So I embedded a picture of our dog, you can see a little guy here, uh, <laughs> right in the application. But we have this product lab board, we have the expansion, we can plug in a camera, uh, we can trigger that with something like a motion sensor and we take that picture and then we can upload that to to Azure Custom Vision or Cognitive Services. I'll bump this off the screen to show you the code. Just a couple of things. What's the, what's the message here? Full.net patterns you recognize. I'm going to scroll down and show you a couple of fun things here. Let's look at the post image method. Let's get off screen here. Some fun things, so he's hitting the endpoint for uh, our Cognitive Services instance. Uh, in this case here, it's loading in a resource. So this would normally come from a camera, but we're loading it an embedded resource in the application. And then we need to send it to our Cognitive Service, our instance. So what we do, we use HTTP client, right? This is the code that you know how to write already. You've probably done this dozens if not hundreds of times. Uh, and again, using standard, standard patterns for talking to, to Azure. Uh, we set up our header and then we just call good old fashioned post async. We're using modern async await here, uploading your image and getting that value back. I'm going to show you, this is a previous run, so this isn't live, but um, this was run just before this presentation. You can see here we upload the image and if we go to our predictions, we can see here 0.99 means 99.99% .99 match. Not too surprised that the picture of my dog matches other pictures of Boston Terriers. She is, of course, a Boston Terrier, but trained it with both Boston Terriers and other types of dogs. And we got 99.9% .9 match that it was a Boston and actually really uh, low match for the other set, the, the not Boston set. Uh, so this is actually really great results. What's fun about this here is I use a very small low res image, 60 by 60 image, and that still worked. I, I'm always amazed at how well these machine learning services work. But now I want to show you one more thing. So let's imagine we built a system, we we're prototyping, we've, we've been working, we want to go that next step. We want to start making a physical product. Well, you can actually start building custom PCBs because we know all the parts we have. And it's another art form as well, but you can design custom PCBs with the parts that you want and need uh, and start making your own physical products. And if you want to learn more about that, actually uh, Brian Kostinich, the CEO of Wilderness Labs, uh, often streams on Twitch and has shown uh, many times how to build custom PCBs. And again, it's another skill set that we as, um, as technologists can absolutely build a lot of logic. It's not simple, um, but it's again, building the foundations, you're making connections and you're just learning a little bit of electronics. And so with that, we can do things like, oh, I don't know, we can build our own custom gaming handheld. Oh, I just realized it wasn't on screen. Let me get that back over here for you. So, so I'll show you here in the back here, here's our Meadow board. Just plugs in to our custom hardware, our custom PCB. 
And again, you're gonna see that same display that we've seen on our other builds. That's our 240 by 240 color display. Like I said, there is an app running on this here as well. So I'm gonna leave that corner, let that fire up. And let me pull up uh, the code here. Now this is gonna run an application that's gonna leverage uh, a really powerful but simple 2D graphics library as part of Meadow Foundation that was called Micrographics. And a community member, uh, a, a friend, and, uh, and someone I admire very much, uh, Justin, built a 2D game engine that runs on top of the 2D library in Meadow Foundation. It uh, allows us to use, uh, to, 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 to build up fairly complex environments in 2D. Let's get the camera to focus on just a little bit better. You should be able to see the clouds moving across the screen. Um, and this is actually built up from a sprite set. Uh, a fully open source is called Glade 2D. Uh, and I think this is really interesting because this is where we see the community and the power of .NET come together with the power of IT and our ability to build custom hardware. And what's beautiful about this is Glade 2D doesn't have any specific hardware dependencies. It's just using the abstractions in Meta Foundation building these 2D environments, then we can now send over to our hardware through the Meadow Foundation drivers. Uh, really powerful, really interesting, really amazing. I'm going to show you a couple links fast. Uh, time is flying by. Um, could talk about all these all day long. Let me just pull up a browser. A few things I want you to be aware of. So again, if you're getting started, you're new to Wilderness Labs, developer.wildernesslabs.co. Uh, big section of Meadow Foundation. If you click on the peripheral driver library, there's a huge collection of drivers. Again, you don't need to learn how to how to do all the, all the sensor readings. It's all built in. You just wire them up, pull the NuGet package, you're ready to go. Uh, of course, almost everything is open source. There's a ton of things on Willers Labs uh, GitHub uh, page. Um, this one has been to Project Lab. So we saw that board a couple of times. So some really great samples. The team's built some amazing things. Examples using Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as well, hooking all kinds of sensors. I mentioned the Seed Studio Grove here. This is using that connector for a soil motion sensor. Uh, lots of good stuff here. And then of course that 2D engine, Glade 2D. Thank you, Justin. This is fantastic. So just getting started here, you can see now, uh, this is a earlier build with the frame rate's lower. You're gonna see performance get better and better and better. Fully open source, pretty fantastic. Uh, I love the .NET community. Uh, you guys are all amazing. And then if you wanna go a bit further as well, if you don't wanna use Project Lab, we wanna build some custom solutions. There's a ton of great stuff on Hackster. I didn't actually get that open, let's get that up. <clears throat> There's a ton of projects on Hackster to search for Wilderness Labs. Uh, and you can see how to hook up all kinds of hardware and build uh, really amazing IoT solutions with C-Sharp and .NET. Uh, there's also a really cool impact sponsorship program. If you are, are uh, socially conscious and, and wanna build things for the greater good in the environment, take a look at this. Uh, some really cool sponsorship opportunities by Wilderness Labs as well. Uh, 